So, here I sit on my ticking biological clock, and the only thing I've known in my entire life is that I want to have a child. Larry came in one day and said, you know, what if uh, she asks, uh, you know, she wants to have a baby, and she asks these guys if they will, you know, impregnate her, and I said, ah, oh, no, you know, <laughs> that's so, that was my, I said, I mean, I, I really just didn't, connect to it at all. Now, I've been taking my temperature and I know I'm ovulating right now. The ground is ready. I just need someone to plant the seed. But I did trust Larry. He'd done a lot of good work and so we we made it work, but the whole time I thought, mm, boy, they're gonna, you know, <laughs> I can't wait to see how this goes over. When we were writing it, I thought it was a terrific, dramatic idea. It did not seem terribly shocking to me and maybe that's a generational thing. I don't know if my wife would agree to such a thing, but I know that I've heard of much more extreme happenings from people I know. So I've always been amused that that was a big talking point in the movie when you consider the kind of behavior that's sort of accepted in movies, that seemed to me very benign. I thought it was insane. <laughs> I mean, at the t I mean, I just, first of all, let me just make one thing clear. My character never asked Glenn. You know, Glenn's character, Sarah, gets this idea, asks her husband, played by Kevin Klein, and then they present the idea to me. I can't imagine asking a woman uh, whether she was that close of a friend or not, if, if you could please have a child with her husband. I, I just, that's not a question I could ever imagine asking anyone. Harold, I want you to do something for me. And I can't imagine anyone ever offering it. Uh, not to say that, you know, and, and over the years, of course, many people have come up and said, well, I would have done that. And then many people have said, I would have never been able to handle that. And I just wanted it to be sweet, you know, because it was such a sweet, generous, albeit strange, offer. And, and I thought the energy of the scene should really just be loving and sweet and tender. Yo as opposed to any kind of, you know, lusty... I mean, that just didn't feel right to me at all. It should just, I thought, be a very tender kind of scene. I feel like I got a great break on a used car. You know, it's an odd thing to have a, a love scene with the whole crew uh, standing around. But it was so sweet. I mean, it was just the sweetest scene. And I was grateful that that, that scene was with Kevin because, you know, we found a way to make it fun and, and more comfortable than, than I ever imagined it could be. <laughs> I'm picking up vibrations here at the house, and uh, I'm almost certain there's sex going on around here. I think it's kind of one of those visceral actions that actually has something to do with redemption. It's the ultimate act of generosity, in a way, um, and of trust, for sure. Uh, but I thought the only way she could possibly have done that was the knowledge that her love for um, Alex was different than the love for her husband. I don't think she ever could have done that with Alex. You don't have to be in such a good mood. I think that it's very hard to lead a decent life and to live in a way that you feel good about. But I believe that decent people try every day, and that this group, which is essentially a decent group, would have been all right. Sarah, Harold, we took a secret vote. We're not leaving. We're never leaving. <laughs> One of the first ideas for The Big Chill that I had was that the movie would end with a flashback to the same group in college on Thanksgiving Day, and you would see the life they had been talking about up till then in the movie. And you would see Alex, who has been missing from the whole movie, the suicide, you would actually see him and what part he played in this group. You would get to compare their memories that you'd been hearing for the first hour and 45 minutes of the movie with the reality that you would see in the flashback. We shot this flashback first. We were in Atlanta and we fixed up a house to look like a house in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I had gone to school. And everyone was in their 60s makeup and hair and wardrobe. And we shot this scene of them making Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, it was a wonderful, after four weeks of rehearsal, it was a wonderful sort of 
crystallization of everything we had been talking about, what it was like to be live in a commune, what it would have been like if they'd all lived together during that time. It sealed that feeling of friendship. And when we cut the flashback together and put it on the end of the movie and showed it not to a public audience but to a group of friends, we discovered that it totally confused the movie. Too much history. It's not right. Mm. We had already accrued in the movie all the benefits of that flashback without actually having to see it. So it was a lucky mistake, I think, that we went ahead and shot the flashback even though we wound up catching, uh, cutting it. The most painful part was that the actor I had cast as Alex was Kevin Costner. He had done very little at that time. He'd been in, only in Testament and a few low-budget films. And he was wonderful as Alex, very charismatic. As you can see, he went on to be very charismatic. And he did good work in that flashback. And when I cut the flashback, he disappeared. The only remnant of him in the movie is that it's his hairline and parts of his body being dressed at the beginning of the film. I never know what to wear these things. All my black stuff is sexy. Aside from this big chunk of the flashback, there were several scenes we took out simply for pace or at the time they didn't seem necessary. And they're mainly comedy scenes and mainly prior to the funeral service in the church. And uh, I think we took them out because we felt they slowed the first part of the movie down. And, and you were so good to me when I came home with Alex. Uh, some of the best memories I have are of sitting around your kitchen table eating that wonderful... Uh, what was that? Was that stew or what? I think that the big chill came from the best possible instincts in my filmmaking life, which was, it was purely personal. I wanted to tell a very specific story about people of my generation. I had no uh, thought of how popular it would be or how many people would relate to it. When a film gets an enormous response the way The Big Chill did, when not only my generation but younger people and older people related to it in a powerful way, you're thrilled because that's your highest hope for something, that you've told something so specific that it can be universal for people. It doesn't always happen. But